thank you for coming. Uh, and welcome on behalf of the Grange uh, this evening uh, to this candidate's forum. Um, the format tonight is going to be pretty simple and straightforward. This is, you know, I'm not Jim Lehrer, so we're not going to be doing any of that business. It's going to be, uh, I'm going to ask each of the candidates to introduce themselves, briefly tell us about themselves, and why they are interested in the office that they're seeking. Adelia is also running for office, but we prefer to sit over there, so we'll get to her as we go around. So, in no particular order. Well, my name is Justin Davis. Um, I've been, I decided to come to Waitley about four years ago, um, and we uh, built the house uh, just over in Pine Plain Estates. Um, and I spent about 10 years in the Marine Corps. I spent uh, also some time as a civilian serving with a infantry brigade. Um, I spent a lot of my time with highly trained, specialized teams. Um, we would be doing just activities in country. Um, we would do a lot of analysis. A lot of this is folks' lives are on the line. So uh, serious decisions have to be made in a timely manner and there's not really much of a second chance at that. They need, they need to be made, they need to be followed through with and executed, and that's a major part of what we did. Um, thinking through those, um, thinking through those things, um, you know, we had to do a lot of um, multi-spectral analysis and things like that. So it's just different innovative approaches at how we look at how we look at data sets and things like that. Um, you know, some of you guys might be wondering what the platform Keep Waitly Affordable means. I just want to say that that for me is a goal. You know, this is about leadership. This is about uh, our ability um, as a community to kind of come together um, and help those folks um, that are on the finance, what, whether it be the finance committee or whatever, to do their jobs. That's kind of the platform of what, why I'm running. Um, so I won't really go on, and I'll, you know, obviously let you guys ask questions as we go along. But hi, uh, my name is Joyce Palmer Fortune. Uh, so I moved to Waitley in uh, early in 1995. Um, just like a week and a half before my youngest son was born, so I was out to here with one. Um, and uh, I remember that uh, that very first week we were here, uh, some neighbors came across the snow from across the street, uh, carrying uh, her two little girls, one on the back, one on the front, uh, to come over and uh, and meet the neighbors. Um, and so that's what my, one of my first memories of Waitley was uh, being welcomed by a neighbor whose kids were about the same age as mine. I thought that was really a wonderful thing. Um, uh, we came to Waitley via, well, I guess technically from Northampton, but that was always a way station. Uh, we'd come from overseas. We lived in Japan for about five years, uh, working as researchers, my husband and I both. Um, and uh, my field is electrical engineering. Uh, and material science, uh, and I teach physics now for a living at Smith College. Uh, so that's kind of my technical background in, in education. When we moved to Waitley, I started my own little consulting company. Uh, I did a lot of work for companies in Boston, uh, and for about eight years or so while the kids were young, because that was very nice to be able to do that out of my home. Then uh, when the opening came up at Smith College to teach physics, I applied for that, and uh, I've been very happy in being in education from that point on. Uh, my two boys, uh, Matt and Alex, they both graduated from Waitley Elementary and from Frontier Regional School. They've now graduated from college, too, so I can't really call them little boys anymore, um, uh, but I still <coughs> refer to them as my children, even though one of them is 25, and he would feel really awkward if I do that in public. Um, uh, let's see, um, why do I want to go back to the select board? Um, and sometimes when people ask me that, they're like, you got to escape. <laughs> uh, why do you want to go back? Because it is, it is a lot of work. It's a commitment of uh, generally at least one night a week, and then some time in between to research things that that need, to, uh, that need to be researched before you get to the next meeting to help make the next decision. 
Um, and I think one of the reasons um, is because when I was on the board, um, my experience as uh, an engineer and as an educator came up many, many times to be a really handy thing to have on that board. And, um, I can give more examples if I had more time. I should probably wrap it up uh, and say that I just, uh, I want to go back because I think that's the kind of, of, of uh, it's the right word. It's the kind of thing we need on a board. We need someone you know, very technically proficient and uh, especially in the world of electrical engineering, there's a, a, it covers a lot, and there have been many, many times when that's been very handy to have when the select board is making decisions. Hi everyone, thank you for coming. My name is Maureen Nichols, and I, my husband and I, and um, my three kids back here, we live in West Waitley, and my children go to Waitley Elementary. Um, for finishing second grade in kindergarten. And I'm currently a stay-at-home mom, and I volunteer a lot at the school, and there a lot. I um, help on the PTO, I go to the meetings, I uh, oversee several of the fundraisers, and, um, you know, make fake goods and help out at whatever events are happening. I um, volunteer for the kids in their classrooms and um, chaperone on field trips. I'm also a member of the school council and I've been a member since fall of 2015. And um, part of the function of that is to review the school improvement plan and the school budget. We don't have a say in it, but we do review it. And um, my background, I my my bachelor's in medical technology and my master's in biostatistics. I most recently was working as a biostatistician in the um, biotech industry. Before that, I was a lab technician in the hospital for several years. Um, so I'm very involved in uh, my kids' school and their education, and I am. Um, I, I believe we have a strong community in Lately and that the school is a big part of that. There's a lot of events around the school that bring people there. And I, I'm excited to join the school committee if elected and to, to offer an additional parent's perspective in um, keeping the school a strong, healthy, dynamic part of the community. And um, I'd like to help, I'd like to meet this objective by becoming a member of the school committee. And I'd like to ask for your vote next week. Thank you. Adelia, you're next. next. I'm next. <laughs> well, I'm Richard Smith. I'm running for my third term as moderator. Um, <coughs> the reason I want to do that is I believe that our town meeting, our open town meeting form of government is sort of the last best place for democracy in the United States. It's where we as citizens get to formulate our own budgets, our own strategies, and take account of one another. And um, I enjoy being a part of that, and I like to conduct it in a, in a manner that I think is, is orderly and that contributes to public discourse. And so I'd like another shot at uh, doing it for the upcoming year. So I would appreciate your consideration next week as well. I'm Adelia Bardwell, and I have uh, put my name out for the elector for the will of Oliver Smith. And I brought you a book, if you want to know all the history, of the, um, the will that was set up by a man who lived in Hatfield, and his objective was to set up money to make it available for people who needed, and at that time, the needs were a lot different than they are today. The towns that get money from the Smith Charities are Northampton, Hadley, Hatfield, Amherst, Deerfield, Greenfield, Waitley, Williamsburg, and there is some given to East Hampton, although they don't have a vote on the board. And the people who can ask for money are tradespersons, nurses, widows, and brides. 
and I'm supposed to make those um, grant applications available, which I have in the past when someone asks for them, or if I see something in the paper that someone's getting married, I might call them and say, this is available to you. So it really is a bank, and it's a very good bank. It makes a lot of money for our local people, and so if you want to know more about it, I will be happy to share that. Um, it is a usually a seven-year term. You have to be elected every year, but you go through a seven-year cycle and then you step down. So um, during that time, two of those years, you are a trustee. Right now, I'm an elector, so that I only go to one meeting a year. The very the duties change as to what your uh, office entails. So. I would appreciate your vote if you would like to see me back at uh, Smith Charities in Northampton. Beautiful old building. If you haven't seen it, you need to look at the architecture. It's gorgeous. It's tucked in among the bars for those of you who aren't. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you all very much for your comments. I will open the floor now. Um, if you have specific questions that you would like to direct at a candidate or candidates, Feel free to do so. In the event that I hear nothing, we've come prepared. We have <laughs> questions. Mr. Paul, how are you? Good afternoon. Candidates, um, I would ask the uh, candidates for the select person position. Joyce said it that the position requires a lot of time, whether it's one night a week or two nights a week or whatever it is. If you could both tell us what the demands are on your time outside of that select person position, because we want someone who's going to put the bulk of their time into that job. Um, you got to go first last time, so we'll just switch off like that. Um, uh, I have a, a full-time job at Smith College which uh, has me uh, doing some grading in the evenings. Um, it uh, tends to be something that's fairly flexible. Um, and that's, uh, so that's one thing that would um, keep me busy in the evenings other than select board related things. Um, let's see, uh, I'm also, you know, members of various other groups. I probably have two or three other meetings per month that are scheduled for those groups. Uh, I'm not an officer in any of these other groups. Uh, so I'm just a, an active member. So that's, a, that's about it for regular commitments. Uh, I guess there's, uh, when, the, you know, when the scoop comes busy, there's a couple days there, but that's only every three months. Um, and I think, oh I, oh, I don't have to go to FCAT meetings anymore, as I'm no longer on the board of FCAT. So, so those are the, uh, so probably fewer meetings now than I had when I served earlier. Sorry about that. Oh. It's Mr. Trump. <laughs> well, let's go ahead and do it. You know, I'll have you in your You gotta love it. You gotta lock the door now. <laughs> Well, I have, I have, currently I have a job that I work about 37.5 hours a week. I look for jobs for uh, folks with disabilities. And um, I also mentor a couple folks about one, or I have about two folks I mentor, um, you know, once every two weeks or so. So um, it doesn't consume a lot of my time. I do have a family and, um, you know, I do like to give time to them. Um, and I will give you know my spare time to them, but I am totally dedicated to you know working with the budget committee because I realize that it, it probably is going to take an enormous amount of time to work through those things, and I'm fully dedicated to that. And I think that that was something that I realized coming into this that uh, you know we were going to have to sit down and go through budget formats, you know, review, review budget requests. Uh, you know, understand the financial committee's positions. I want to know what your guys' positions are. I want to know how we can really work together. I think that's within my reach. Um, and I feel like that's why I said at the beginning of this, this is about leadership. This is about my ability to come out as a board member and support you guys any way that I can. 
and uh, and I will do that. And um, you know, I do have some commitments, but I don't feel like they're overwhelming at this at this point. Thank you. Thank you, John Robolewski. Um, I guess the both of select board candidates, um, I've been involved in like the municipal building committee uh, over the past several years, on and off, and currently on. And at one of the meetings, it kind of bothered me that the select board, of which Joyce was a member, uh, made a statement that the finance committee was only advisory in nature to the select board. And I'm not sure that that's the way I see it or anybody else sees it, that I think you folks got to work together and not look at subcommittees as strictly advisory. So I know that comment was made in an open meeting and maybe Joyce, you can address that. Um, I don't think this finance committee is just advisory to the select board. Um, they advise the entire town. Um, and the great thing about town meeting and town our form of government is that you all get to make the actual decisions. And the finance committee's job is to give the best advice possible they can to the whole town. So if, uh, if that was implied at any meeting, then that is definitely not what I think. I don't think that this, the finance committee is simply advisory to the select board. Uh, the select board also, it, we just, on, you know, on your town meeting warrant, it says select board recommends, finance committee recommends, Select board doesn't even decide the budget. Everybody decides it at town meeting. Uh, and if it's a big enough expense, we decided at the ballot box. Um, so I, I, I don't know if I'm being misquoted or if I just spoke badly. But that's what I, that's what I actually think. No, I mean, I, I had some things that I, had, I looked through and you know, like I, you know, I mean, I would love to contribute also to the developing of financial forecasts. Um, that, that's, a, that's an area where I really feel like I could bring in some expertise. Um, you know, the capital planning process, you know, I really want to figure out how we can get, and this is about teamwork too, you know. I, I think that with my background, you know, I could really come in and, you know, I've dealt with Army Green Berets, Navy SEALs on, on those levels. I've been able to work with people who are highly specialized and I want an opportunity to work with the tremendous capability that we have in Whaley. I think, you know, I've, I've heard of you, sir, and I think that you've done an outstanding job. And, uh, you know, I would love to work right next to you. I really would. And I'm not trying to flatter you. I've just... I, I realize that you put your heart and soul into this, and, uh, and I appreciate that. I really do. Another question? I have a question from Maureen. All right. Um, I thought you were going to do that. <laughs> Currently, the school committee has very little impact on the budget that comes through the school. Um, just how, how do you foresee you think that should change? You, you think the school committee should have um, more input, more um, um, more decision making I, at that end? I do. It, if, if they don't have much impact, I think that is one of their primary responsibilities is to approve the budget. So um, I think the school committee should have a voice mm -hmm. in making decisions. Yeah, we have. Um, if currently, um, there is a timing issue between the, the, the budget being formulated and the budget being voted on and passed, and it's very constricted. And um, boy, I'd, I'd like to see someone in there that could understand that and try to remedy it. I, I'm excited to learn more about the budget. I'm hoping. Um, if I'm elected to meet with Patty Kavanaugh, the business manager, and go through it with her so that I really understand it. That's it? Okay. You sure? <laughs> I'll give you an opportunity later, but I might be back. Fred. 
Yes, uh, for question directed towards the select board candidates. As you may know, we have a housing committee in town that's looking at low-income and senior housing, trying to decide where, what we need, if we need it, and how much. What are your views on that? Do you think that's an important item? And what would you do to, uh, I guess, promote that? Well, um, oh, actually, actually, oh, got you start. <laughs> I got to start last. Um, the, from what I know of the senior housing is, is that this is going to be uh, dedicated towards lower income individuals. I, I, I would, I mean, I would take a look at expanding it out to people who do have fixed income, but maybe you know, on the border, somewhere at the threshold. So, I think that's what I know about it. Is that correct? Is that is that? Am I stating that correctly? This okay. has to do with the Habitat for Humanity. That's one option of doing it. That's one way of doing it. Yes. Yeah, I think. Um, yeah, I think that we look at um, you know that from those different perspectives. People who are threshold, you know, the lower income folks. Um, I think that, if, from my understanding, um, I would expand that out so that we take into consideration all of our older citizens who, you know, are moving into. <laughs> more of a fixed income situation. I think that's important to me, taking care of our older folks, considering them. That's important. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. <clears throat> um, when I uh, was first elected to the select board in uh, 2009, we didn't even have a housing committee. Um, that was something that actually happened while I was on the select board. And it took a while to find people who had the right uh, you know, knowledge base to actually do something like that. So I'm happy that they are at the point that they are getting to. Uh, I think it is also helpful that we have the CPA with some uh, housing money that gets set aside so that this doesn't uh, become a budget item, so to speak. Um, I think uh, there's also some uh, considerations from the state. If you have a certain percentage of, of uh, low income housing in your community, then you're eligible for things that you're not eligible for if your community does not. So I think it is important, uh, certainly in that sense, and it's also important for people to be able to afford to live uh, in, in our community. And I think um, that uh, Jared is right. It's often people who are in fixed incomes seats who run up against that first. Um, and so if we have some low income housing in the, in the town, I think we would have enough people in the town with low incomes to fill it. Um. Thank you. Scott Jackson, then I'm um, my question to you, Justin, because I don't know you and I don't know anything about you. Absolutely. Um, but I see your signs around town, and some of your signs say, Keep Waverly Affordable. And so I wonder what does that mean? Is that just a statement of your political philosophy, or are there specific decisions that the select board or the town meeting has made that you disagree with? Well, I thank you for the question. Um, and yeah, I think that, like I said in the beginning, that's really keeping Waitley affordable is just a goal. Uh, the priority there is really to have a situation where we don't have any in unexpected rises in taxes. You know, we know that taxes are going to increase, we know that that's going to happen. But, but how I would tie those together is exactly what I stated about working with the Finance Committee. Um, finding ways to work with these folks and you know be a team member and know what they're looking at, the processes they're looking at. How are they, you know, the, board, the budget format is a really good one because it shows us kind of the modeling, you know, how we're looking at the data. Um, you know, we need to take apart the bigger budget items and take a look at them and review them and you know I think that that's important to kind of know what we're paying for um, and see if we can work together because you know there's a lot um, I think to be said for us coming together knowing more and as we get into these things and also the big part of it is capital planning you know planning for capital items you know 15 years out from now so that we can fund those things, you know, earlier on and take care of those things. But you know, that I would definitely refer to the finance committee on all these things because these are the experts. And I would, like I said before, this is about leadership for me and teamwork. 
And so I would just find a way, however I could, to, to take care of what I could to get things done. And that's... So if I could just follow up, sir. Is it your opinion that there are things that need to be fixed about the substance or the process of budgeting and waiving? Absolutely. Well, yeah, there's, I mean, I think Paul Newland said that we spend, you know, an hour on a $40 shovel and spend five minutes on a million dollar budget. You know, the things like that, I think, are things that we could definitely fix. And I don't know if I can, I quoted you completely accurately, but I mean, that's, that's where we're at currently. And I think that if we can put that process out, look at it beforehand, you know, get into, you know, get into the planning, you know, of the budget sooner and, and figure those things out. And working together, board and finance committee, that we, as the chief executive body, we would have the ability to do those things. We have every right to get in there and do as, work as closely as we can with the finance committee. You know, these people, the people that do the, that job should be essentially, the way I think about it, is kind of our new best friends. Um, we should be working that closely with them where we know what's, what they're thinking and understanding what they're looking at. Um, so that's, that's important to me, I think, and, then, and I think that that could change. Mr. Can I respond to <laughs> <laughs> um, I said something similar. Yeah. As long as, as, what I don't want is a debate between a current member oh, no. of the board and the candidates, so. Maybe this is just a clarification. Oh, clarification, I'll clarification. accept the word clarification. Yeah, I believe the issue once was of a $7,000 shovel that we had a long discussion about, and I was struck by the fact that we just passed a $4 million budget without much talk. But the, the point, the point I'd like to underscore is that the bulk of that larger budget is school spending. And the problem from my select board position was we have very little control over school spending. So I would like to know, this is my question now if I may, I would like to know, given that the school is the largest source of tax expenditures, um, how you would work to reduce that level because if you can reduce the school budget then we can lower our taxes. Are you directing that? And that's a question. How would you reduce that? Here. You're actually directing that question to everyone since we well, have a candidate for school committee. That's true. And okay. She would be part of the initial sure. budget. I'd, I'd love to see a way to maintain the level of our education while reducing the cost of it. If you could add to how you would do that, I'd be delighted to hear. I actually, if you could actually come up with a solution. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if the I can world would love to hear right it. now. I, I would really like to understand the budget first and see where everything is being spent before I could comment on that. I don't know. I have a very good answer right now. But that gives me something to think about. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, this is something that is not the first um, time I've had a conversation about just this, this, this very issue. Um, this, uh, it's an intractable problem because, uh, to a large extent, uh, the state mandates much of what we have to spend um, in the schools and what we have to provide in the schools. And it doesn't really give the local groups uh, all that much flexibility in, in what they can cut or what they can do, you know, what they can choose to do without. There are a lot of things you can't choose to do without under state law. So we have uh, a lot of constraints that are, that are frankly unreasonable. Um, but given the constraint, I mean, and this, it, it can go further on up the food chain here. The, the state never actually ponied up when they did Ed reform in the 90s. They never, they never stepped up and took care of their promise to fund things like special education, which at one point, I don't know if it's every single year, but at one point when I was on the select board, the elementary school budget was something like a third special ed. And you can't touch that. Okay, so, so in, in many ways, that's one of the reasons why it's hard for a school community member to have a lot of impact on the budget because the things that you're allowed to play with are so small. Um, so I have put effort into lobbying our, our uh, state rep and our state senator um, just on being able to free up more money for schools 
um, so that they can keep the promises they made with that reform. Um, now that said, if we have the constraints that we have, and there's, there's things that we do well together as towns. Um, and I count Frontier Regional as one of the things we do better together at Frontier. And, and one of the reasons why our Frontier budget doesn't have a lot of jerks up and down is because we pool all the special ed for all of the towns are pooled into one bucket and each town pays a proportion of it. Um, and that keeps our special ed expenditures pretty level so that you don't have, like all of a sudden, some year, $150,000 new charge because a student moved into your town um, or a student moved among the towns. Now Sunderland's got the problem that Waitley used to have or something like that. Um, I don't know short of regionalizing the school districts a legal way for us to be able to share and somehow pool our special ed programs at the elementary level. Uh, it would be a really hard thing to talk all the towns into doing, amending a regional agreement. But short of doing something really big like that, getting the state to act, well, which seems actually really, uh, I don't know, I guess that's a lot harder than maybe getting three towns to act. But there are things we can do if we work together because our neighboring towns are facing the same problems that we are. And that's gotta be a route that we should explore given just how immobile our uh, state legislature has been. Um, they, just to give you an idea, um, at uh, the municipal conference they had each year in uh, usually in March or April maybe six years ago we asked them to look at what's called tax expenditures and those are basically tax breaks that the, the state gives to companies um, or groups or just uh, someone who would otherwise have to pay taxes um, and the amount of tax money that we go without is called a tax expenditure um, that's about the same size as the state budget. Okay, we're talking about two piles of money, they're about the same size. So we asked them, and they, they formed a commission to go look at all the tax expenditures. They could not find one single tax expenditure. They couldn't find a single tax break that they could do without. They couldn't find a single one. Uh, even the one that, there were so many ridiculous examples of tax breaks that were given to groups. And those tax breaks, don't get reviewed every year, our budget gets reviewed every year. And we look through it for things that we, that we can do without, or things we don't need anymore that we used to need. Our budget goes through this yearly process. Tax expenditures never do. So, so that's one of the things we're up against. We're up against a state that isn't really willing, to state government that's not really willing to do what they promised to do 30 years ago to, to educate our children. And I think given those constraints, we're doing pretty well. Thank you for your eloquent endorsement of the <laughs> <laughs> um, Yeah, I mean, I, you know, first I would start by probably having, you know, our town administrator who seems to be pretty effective. Um, maybe we can meet with the superintendent um, and the business manager from, you know, Frontier Regional and see if we can work together on a local level to see if we can rein in some of the spending. I realize that the, you know, it's, some of it is just off limits, you know, and, and I do realize that, but um, I, it doesn't, it's not gonna stop me from <coughs> um, And I, I would try everything to really do whatever I could to support that. Um, and it seems like our, or our town administrator is pretty squared away, so I think that you know, he'd be pretty capable of getting that arranged and maybe taking a look at it. You know, I think it's within reason. George. I'd just like to follow up a little bit on the question of keep away the affordable, the sort of campaign <coughs> slogan, I guess, that you promoted. I mean, there is a kind of, um, I want to choose my words carefully here, there is a slightly provocative nature to it in the sense that when I read it driving down the road, the first thing that comes to my mind is, wait a minute, you know, why that? It didn't say keep Whaley schools strong. You know, it didn't say you know clean the environment. So, do you feel that there we're on the verge of it not being affordable, no, or what is the what is the implication? And by the way, can I have a second part to my question? I mean, there's two ways to keep Whaley affordable. One is to reduce costs in the school, and the other is to have more income. 
And the way we've been doing income, I think, I'm not speaking out of turn, is by investing in solar power. Um, is that true? I mean, it, that, that's income for the town, right? I, I can answer that one. I, well, anyway, my question well, don't is... Don't look at the moderator for details on administering the My My naive understanding of the solar power thing was that it was actually a source of income. If I'm wrong about that, it's a show me down. But I'm trying to make a bigger point, which is simply that keeping way the affordable has potentially a lot of dimensions to it beyond this sort of a disgruntlement with the current state of taxes. <coughs> if you understand where I'm coming from. Yeah, no, I, and I and, and I would just be curious for both of you, all of you, really, because the school is so well to comment on that. Absolutely. Um, no, and thank you for your question. Um, the, the, the whole idea there is that that's just a goal. That's you know that's where I start. Um, you know I think I think when you're when you're talking about leadership, you have to start somewhere. It's it, this isn't like I'm not trying to take a, a shot at anybody. You know, and I realize that I, I know what you're saying, and I can appreciate it. Um, this is just a goal. You know, we, we want to let people know with transparency what our goal is. Our goal is, is to keep Whaley affordable. And I think, you know, I think the citizens are entitled to know what our idea is. Um, and it's not to take a shot at anybody. It's not to undermine anybody or anything like that. You know, it's, it's just a campaign. Um, and, you know, Joyce has done an excellent job on the FCAT, the solar, you know, and, and that's, I think that she's, that her public service is great. It, it definitely speaks to the, to, to the vitality of Waitley's volunteerism, you know. Um, and yeah, absolutely, you're welcome. And um, you know, that, that's the thing, is that, what I wanna do is I, I wanna bring people together. You know, that's the thing. I don't wanna, this isn't a divisive thing. It's, 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 a, it's a goal. And uh, I hope that answers your question, sir. Thank you. Thank you. So okay, can I address it too? Sure. Um, because on the income side, that you're you're right. The state also controls what we're allowed to do. What are the possible ways we can raise money? Um, and it basically falls into the category of well, property tax or excise tax. Um, and the if you're a, a corporation, there are different ways of getting out of paying those local taxes. Um, for the longest time, um, a company that was known under various names, it was Deerfield Urethane for the longest time, and now it's owned by a company called Bayer. Um, the state law had changed such that they, um, they, they, for a long time, were a manufacturing company, and that meant that they did not have to pay a local excise tax on their equipment. So we, we got very little from Bayer in the way of local taxes. Um, they changed their status to take advantage of a, a state law where that meant they got a really big state tax break, but it would make them liable for the local tax. Um, and I mean, I, I don't want to claim that I'm the only one who, who was there. Paul and Jonathan were there as well, but Bayer came to the town and said, well, we're, we don't normally pay, we haven't paid taxes to you. We, we'd like to continue not paying taxes to you. And we all come and just said, no, you need to pay taxes just like everybody else. And do you know what, that year, the first year that they paid taxes was the first year in 15 years that we actually bought anything on the capital uh, budget. We'd, uh, we'd ignored capital needs for about 15-ish years, Paul? What do you think? But basically, something really had, the rain had to be coming in the roof uh, in order to, to get it fixed, and they were done by little overrides here and there. Um, we actually, because that company got back on the tax rolls, we had money to pay uh, for things that we had long put off. Okay, so I think it is important that we be able to uh, to keep the, the you know make make it not so easy for companies to get out of paying their taxes. Um, when the solar law changed, um, it was a it's a very same kind of tax, an excise tax. Uh, the two solar farms that are up and running now bring us about thirty-five thousand dollars a year, which is I don't know after you factor in benefits, what's that? Half a teacher at the school, something like that. Um, and there's a few more that are kind of on the horizon. Um, it's a kind of of money that we can raise, and uh, it's been very beneficial for the farmers who would put these in generally land that is less 
um, less arable than others. But the farmers decide that. We don't decide that. The farmers decide whether the land would be better used for solar farms. Um, and, uh, and we basically are allowed to collect the tax that we otherwise wouldn't be able to collect. So that's why, that's how it becomes a source of income for the town. Cool. Yeah. Um, I remember the finance committee, and this year I know I see a couple of the members here. We spent considerable time on the question of putting money aside for capital, evening out down the road. Uh, you say that that's something you would want to do to avoid big tax increases in the future, and we've been doing it. What kind of percentage tax increase would you find tolerable in the current year to avoid those big spikes in future years? What kind of a tax increase? What kind of tax increase now? Because that's what you have to do. If you want to level out the spending in the out years, you've got to raise taxes now and put that money away. What kind of percentage in the tax rate would you say would be tolerable for that purpose? I, I honestly wouldn't feel comfortable saying that I would put a raise on taxes without looking Where's the money at, coming from to well, pay without, those, those capital well, without without looking at the budget. You know, without looking at the, the items that we're going to be doing and, and going through that and vetting that, we need to vet those things. I well, said, that we've got you know, the finance committee. We sat down with the select board this year in joint meetings, and we went through that budget and had to come up with recommendations for what kind of money we want to put away for police cruisers and equipment for the town. And you have just said you want to avoid those increases in the future. What would you be willing to do now in terms of tax increases to accomplish that? I don't know. I don't, honestly, the, the way that I feel about the question is is that you're trying to ask me a question about raising taxes yes. for a specific reason. Yes, absolutely. And I don't really have an answer for that, but you know, I would love to get back to you on it. Is that all right? So, all, all I'm saying is we have dealt with this issue, and Paul and Jim will attest to them this off, because we dealt with that extensively this year of how much, how to put money away, where is it going to come from, how much to put away. So this is not a new issue, and then you've just come in and said. And I will say I'm slightly offended as a member of the finance committee that you came and said, well, I'll do this, when it's something that we've been doing. Yeah, no, I mean, my and, thing is And that, where is the money going to come from to even out the out years? My Trust thing is, is that I want to focus on working with the finance committee. That's the main objective that I have, is that, you know, you I want to work. specifically said you want to even out those tax increases in the future years, and I'm mm -hmm. asking you, where is the money coming from? But this, I mean, this is a slightly polemical argument. I mean, I don't know. I'm addressing your question. I think yeah. he's heard the okay. question. question. I'm sorry. That's all right. Uh, <clears throat> OK. I think your point is big. Paul. Well, yeah, a couple of things. <clears throat> Joyce is correct about the increase on Bear, But unfortunately, Bear last year found a different legal status that they could assume which would relieve them of paying the personal tax on, on the equipment, the, the property, the personal tax, I think it's called, yep. of $200,000. So we're out that money. But I wanted to address what I think the select board should, could focus on. And by the way, we have been working with the finance committee. This year was one of the smoothest years in what? ever where the select board and the finance committee met a lot. We did. I can attest to that, Paul will agree. And it paid off. We had a town meeting that took about an hour to go through 27 or so articles, which was a record. I think Richard will attest to that. And that's in large extent due to the fact that, that uh, the finance and the select board have been cooperating and meeting together and seeing and arguing about issues and, and seeing eye to eye and making compromises where necessary. But my question is, getting back to what I think this fellow over here raised about generating revenue. And, and I think, um, you know, the, our ability to generate revenue is very constrained because we're a rural residential community with a lot of farming land, which isn't highly taxed. We've got a lot of 61A land, which isn't highly taxed. And we've got a lot of residential, which are heavily taxed 
uh, intensive because uh, we need to support the schools. So one of the things I would ask you both to consider is another way to raise revenues would be through economic development. Now admittedly, I won't, I won't prejudice you by suggesting things we've thought about or I've thought about, but I'd be curious to uh, hear from you how you think Waitley could um, maybe work with other towns or within our own borders to uh, generate some more revenue through economic development that's not currently in place and what that economic development might consist of. I've lost track of who's first. And you want to take the Well, I think um, there's uh, a couple of things that come to mind. Um, and the first one is that um, since we purchased this building that we're in right now, uh, it seems as though we're consolidating uh, maybe more than we originally thought. I think originally we thought that the emergency medical system was going to go in here, but uh, they're not. Uh, and maybe our highway department <coughs> will eventually be working out of that back garage. And so we may have any number of properties that are on the town's rolls that could be redeveloped for one thing or another. Uh, much in the way our, I mean, our town hall is going to be redeveloped into a community center. Um, and once the parking problem is taken care of, that could actually be a, a revenue generating source there. And either it's directly or indirectly. Um, indirectly because I think the weight lean is going to be packed on nights when there's something going on uh, and we've got a little bit of a meals tax there um, uh, or you know I don't know what's going to happen to this center school um, some if someone were interested in buying it to put something in that might be an interesting idea my one concern about the center school is that that piece of land ought to be a public park I think that would also draw people in so we have to be very thoughtful about it, but we have some, some resources, some uh, land, some locations that right now are not generating uh, any revenue for the town. Um, I think, let's see, if I count on my, I'd probably just need one hand, the blue school, the center school, uh, with the town hall, though that's kind of uh, taking care of itself. There's the DeMaio property. Um, I feel like the town owns one other piece of land that might be slipping my mind. Um, but I think if we were to try to do some local economic development, it's going to have to involve those. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I think a lot of times that, you know, if we can manage our assets, um, I talked to Brian a little bit about the center school. Um, I talked about the rezoning issue a little bit. It looks like it has to go, like if it were to be rezoned, it would have to go through Franklin Regional County Governments. So, um, I, I, you know, there's a lot of different things that I think that we could work through and do to some of the, some of the land there. We could, um, I've heard citizens say things that I think are pretty good ideas. I mean, about parking at the Waitley Inn. Um, maybe having a situation where we could create a little bit of revenue there, maybe working with a local business um, for the parking situation. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, taking care of our assets, too, is a, is a major priority because, um, you know, we're going to have to look at things like the town garage and things like that, that that need to be, you know, they need to be assessed and we need to see how much we can get out of them, if anything. Um, you know, maybe maybe taking a wrecking ball to things isn't the smartest option, you know, but we definitely need to, we need to take an honest look at it and, and we need to, to vet all these different things. And that would be my idea, is to just kind of work through the issues and know what we have, take care of what we have. I'd like to pick up a little bit on some of the conversation over here with reference to keeping uh, keeping Waitley affordable. Uh, when I moved here, I moved here for the rural aspect, and I, I've been talking with people, and people seem to really appreciate the rural aspect, which of course 
is not necessarily compatible with high-end uh, economic development and that kind of thing. My question is, how do you balance affordability with ruralness when those two start to clash? How would you, how would you go about balancing that situation? And, and specifically to your point, what, uh, so when you, you're saying keeping if, the lands. If, if somebody wanted to build a 30 unit apartment, or if somebody wanted to come in um, and get a rezoning from agricultural land to, uh, to, to industrial so that there could be a, be a larger industrial. But on the other hand, that would do something, some detriment to the rural character of the town. How would you balance the benefits and the costs of both of those, rural and um, affordable? That's a really good question. Um, you know, honestly, I mean, I would want to first and foremost figure out what the town's people would want, and especially the people who are going to be immediately impacted by any kind of major decision, like you were saying, and it turning something into something else or industrializing something. Um, I would want to know from the local folks, you know, what the, what the issue is and how we can address it. I mean, people in my neighborhood, for example, you know, there's a problem with the manganese smell in the water, you know, and, and so people know about the issue, people are talking about the issue. I, you know, it's an, it's an issue in my neighborhood. Uh, you know, I would go to those people and say, you know, uh, how would this affect you? How would this impact Waitley? And I would absolutely want to balance thing. I, I don't think that um, there's one good side to either argument, and let, you know, until we would lay it all out on the table, but I don't really, Specifically, I don't really know of any instances, you know, so I... I just if I can have a quick follow-up, you, you've mentioned several times leadership. Yeah. And I think leadership involves having a position of some sort and going, I mean, ge generally speaking, people will not want what they don't like in their, in their backyard. Yeah. So if somebody is going to build a factory next to me, if you ask my opinion, <laughs> I'm going to say no. Yeah. But it could very well be that a factory in my backyard is really vital to the town and will keep the town affordable because there'll be so many more taxes. So how would you use your leadership skills to help frame the question in such a way that you really get reasonable answers and not just not just selfish answers? I mean, you know, building support around an idea, you know, I, I deal with business leaders every day, you know, I mean, when I'm trying to integrate a person with disabilities into the workforce, that's a very hard thing to do. And it actually takes a lot of work. It's not just, I can't just go to a local business and say, hey, I would like to place this person here. What can, what, you know, you've got to do it for me or something like that, you know, and also the person that I'm placing, there, there is, there's always opportunity costs, you know, and I think that having a balanced approach and, and also helping guide those people to make quality decisions for themselves you know, it is an important aspect of leadership. But the most important thing for leadership to me is to be present, you know, to, to talk to those folks every day, uh, make sure that, you know, you're in contact with them and, you know, and, 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 you know, understanding what their needs are and how you can, how you can be the best neighbor that you can be to them. Joyce, your comment? Um, it's, it's a tough one. Um, because it you know puts kind of in, in the way the you know, needs of the many versus you know, the, the needs or desires maybe of a smaller subset. Um, we have a pretty conservative system uh, in the sense that it's resistant to change, um, and uh, I think uh, that uh, Justin is right in that in order to get change in that kind of a conservative system, um, you really have to get everybody in the room. I think the last two years and moving forward on the town hall kind of showed that that, that has to be the case, that you have to have everybody in the room. Um, and in the end, uh, the answer has to kind of come up organically. Um, I'm not sure it's so much a matter of leadership in the sense of, this is what I think we should do. I think it's leadership in the sense of getting people together to talk about it so that the best answer kind of bubbles up from below. 
that's that's kind of the way I see it. Uh, leadership. Uh, maybe I have a different take on it than many people, but I feel like leadership, in a way, comes from listening and coming from, coming from below rather than from above. Thank you. Yes. So a lot of talk tonight about affordability and finance, which obviously is a very very important topic in this town. But if that's all you're interested in, you should learn from the finance committee. There are other groups in. I get to appoint those people. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> um, there are other initiatives. There are a lot of other initiatives going on in this town. Other committees and commissions that uh, a lot of people work very hard on. And I guess what I want to ask is, what's your familiarity and experience with all of the other things that are happening um, as part of your responsibility as the executive board commission over the town? Yeah, I mean, I, I, um, I'm involved in the climate committee at the school. I, there's not been much action there, but I'm, I'm constantly involved with the people at the Waitley School, Waitley Elementary. And, um, you know, I, my, my level of, you know, understanding is, you know, go out and talk to the folks and see what's happening and, and you know, and like, you know, that's what it's about. That's what leadership is about. It's about being there, talking to the principal, um, you know, talking to the various teachers and, and stuff like that and getting a beat for things. And I, I totally agree with your point, you know, getting involved with these committees and, um, you know, I've, John Robleski uh, is my neighbor and we, we've been talking a lot about the building committee, you know, so we've, I've been involved with talking with him a lot about kind of what's going on with the, that building project and just understanding the scope and nature of things and stuff like that. So and you know other neighbors that I have as well um, so you know yeah it's definitely a thing where you have to be involved and you have to have an understanding I think as uh, generally what's happening absolutely oh my god I'm not sure where to begin because <laughs> um, I, I kind of first got my start on, on the PTO and the school council so let's start there um, so you see where you Sky is <laughs> honestly. Um, but I think uh, for me, and I, I took advantage of at least some of my, my education and resume, was in uh, kind of communication. Um, we started the scoop as a project of collaboration between the PTO, the Grange, the Stor Historical Society, and the Cultural Council. Uh, funded the first year of the scoop. Uh, and before that, we didn't really have uh, an easy way to get news to everybody in the town. Um, and it took you know, some, a few determined people and an uh, initial budget of $1,200 for the first year. Um, that was, that's something that I've always been involved in, in trying to get just information, just get information to people. I find when you do that, people will read it, think about it, and make the right decision. Um, the other communication-related thing is, um, oh gosh, that was before I was on the select board. I walked into the town offices and Mark Gilmore from Deerfield was there saying, well, we're trying to negotiate with Comcast to get more money for cable access. And I said, well, what is cable access? Because we didn't really have it uh, in Waitley uh, until we renegotiated a contract with our neighbors, Sunderland and Deerfield, uh, to leverage that for some, some actual money. So now we're getting nearly 5% of the gross revenues that Comcast makes in our three towns that go towards funding Frontier Community Access Television. Uh, and since then, uh, Conway has joined. And so the same uh, percentage of their revenue. Uh, so now you can see these meetings uh, on the internet. You can see them soon, we'll have them in real time here. Um, but uh, there, was a, a, there was a nice confluence of interest in getting better communication. Um, there, was, there were people who told me outside of meetings, oh, thank you so much because when those meetings were not being taped or televised, oh, you wouldn't believe what people were saying. Um, and the towns, uh, mostly Deerfield, from what I understand, people would come in and want to sue them for something. <coughs> they told me this at the selectmen's meeting, and they pull the tape and say, no, we did not tell you this at the selectmen's meeting. Um, so having that uh, small-scale infrastructure and communications um, has been awesome. And uh, the last thing I did when I was on the board at FCAT was hired Chris Collins to run the place. Um, uh, so uh, South County News, Mr. South County News is what I'm going to start calling him. Um, but I'm really, really proud of my involvement in MCAT, which started before I was on the select board, but continued 
uh, all through, I guess, a little bit late last year when I was kicked off for term limits. The term limits. <laughs> we discussed on my porch the other day <laughs> how you ended up being kicked off, as it were. Other questions? Well, it's um, a little bit of background that out of it comes a question. I'm going to say 15 years ago, uh, there was a series of meetings um, up in the old town hall, uh, and we had some consultants that looked at the town with the idea of sort of a master plan, and it had to do with economic development. Uh, we had sort of a, a something we, we call an industrial park, which is limited, and a lot of it is limited because we don't have sewer. Uh, there's an awful lot of industry, the type that provides jobs and ultimately revenue, tax revenue, that just isn't available to us because we don't have the sewer um, Part of what they started with, and I want to say the group was, was it Conway? Does anybody remember this? They came in and they showed a bunch of slides and had us fill out sheets. Yeah, I, I, do, I do remember that. Here's a picture of a tractor. How's that make you feel? Yeah. One to ten. We like tractors. <laughs> Here's a picture of a factory with a big smokestack. No, we don't like that. Then there was a picture of Channing Beef. Yeah, we could do that. You know, a lot of jobs. Not much in the way of truck traffic, not dirty, yada yada. But out of that, there was an idea for a sort of town center. Um, you might be able to get a haircut there. Or a restaurant. We have two eating establishments owned by the same family, one high end, the other one not so. Well, and there's the diner, too. Yes, there's the diner. I'm sorry. We've got muffins, too. <laughs> Yes, now muffins and new ones. <laughs> um, and I thought it was kind of an interesting process, and part of it was to identify some areas of land which would make sense because it wouldn't really be good for high end housing and really not that arable. Um, would that make sense? And all that sort of fizzled. Uh, or at least I'll admit ignorance that I don't know where it went. I'm, my question to the candidates, would you be interested in finding out about that process and picking up on it? So that, I don't think you need to reinvent the wheel to talk about economic development. A lot of those conversations have already been had. Let's let the uh, candidates respond to that. Yeah, it's a that. Um, back from the early 2000s. And um, what I remembered the most was that there was, it was like we really couldn't find a good location for that town center. There was some talk of it being over on Christian Lane, uh, and there was some talk of it being kind of library, town hall, center school. Um, but I know there were things that blocked it in both cases, and I don't recall the details of what they were. Um, the master plan would probably be worth dusting off and looking at again. Um, but you know, things change over the years, so it may be that you can use that you know, as a starting point, at least one part of the conversation. Um, but our situation is a little bit different now that the town hall and the uh, center school are not being used for what they were being used for back in 2002. So that's, um, that I think it'd be great to look at. I do vaguely remember it, and I just remember it kind of coming down to a, gosh, we don't really know what to do with this information that we got. Go ahead, Paul. I know you're Thank just you. Just jumping into the chat. Thank you. Just a second. Lovely wife. So do I. Lovely. Um, regarding that process, which happened about 15 years ago, the reason that died is the same reason the $3.9 million um, town hall project died. It's because it passed, it, it was in, it was a lot of enthusiasm at the meeting level, it passed on the floor level, but in the ballot box, it died. 
because of the hit on taxes, and it wasn't sold well um, by anybody. And it was, if I'm not mistaken, it was Margo Jones Associates that came in and did the whole, uh, did the whole thing. And I, if, and I can remember a number of 185. Um, you know, that woman comes to this town and she sees, <laughs> You see dollar signs, but that's another story. Um, so you're saying democracy works. There you go. Democracy works. Yep. Um, but the um, but it was a great plan. It really was a nice plan. Uh, the, the town center was going to be where the town garage is now, and it was going to it was going it was going to be a multi-use <coughs> building of some sort. But I just want to comment, if, if I could just ask my final question. For real? Thank you. <laughs> uh, just as a comment regarding uh, the affordability in Waitley, and I, I, I think the answer to that is when you go to, town, to a town meeting and look at the youth on that floor and look at those people who have full heads of hair, dark, and there aren't a lot of them. And there aren't a lot of them because young families have a hard time affording this town. So it's, it's there, there is an affordability issue with the town. Um, so I just wanna make that point, and do you agree with that? Yeah, I would caveat right into that and say that I think that that goes kind of with the community center thing, you know, attracting younger people to be involved in the process, I know, you know, would definitely be a goal of mine. Um, I think that, you know, we definitely need to have younger people become a part of our town and become integrated into this town. Um, and uh, I can definitely see a desperate need for that. So um, I know I've talked about it with several of my neighbors, so absolutely, I agree with that. You actually set that up very nicely because one of the questions that has been submitted was when making appointments to town committees, would you appoint those who have lived here forever or would you appoint new blood to those committees? So you know, Other questions or comments? You know, I think we've had a really good hour plus session and I have some questions here that were submitted by folks who are here tonight um, that I think in general had been addressed, not necessarily specifically. <clears throat> there was one written question that I received before the meeting, which I will ask all candidates um, a version of, and it, it, it kind of, for me, is a, it, it speaks to values more than specifics. And we're just curious, um, of what you are most proud in your lives? Honestly, um, what I'm most proud of in my life is probably my wife. Uh, but I'm, you know, I'm really also proud. Um, I guess you know I put God in very high regard, and um, and I have to say that I do that. Um, and I put my reading of the Bible in high regard. Um, but my wife and my daughters are incredibly important to me. And, uh, sorry, um, I wouldn't be the person I am, so thank you. Well, I think there's a lot of things that I, um, I have a lot of pride in. Um, my family, of course. Um, and I could gush on about my family for a while, but I, that's, that's probably not the right form for that. Um, I'm proud of being really involved with my community for the last 22 years. Um, and the many of the things that have come of it are, are things that everybody recognizes. So uh, I'm trying to think of things specifically related to being on the select board. Um, I'm, I'm proud that we made fair pay taxes. Um, I'm proud that we got FCAT off the ground as a three-town effort. I'm glad we got South County EMS off the ground as a three-town effort. Things where we 
none of us could have done those all by ourselves, but we got three towns to work together to get those things working, and I'm really very proud of those. Um, I should probably stop there. Um, I'm also very proud of my family, um, my three kids, my husband, and my extended family, too. I'm also proud of um, my education, just growing up, we didn't have much, and I was the first person to get a four-year degree, and then a master's, too, so I'm pretty proud of that. And um, I'm also proud of how involved and interested I am with the school. I, I wish that more parents had time mm -hmm. to, to do what I do. Thank you. Yeah. I could say the same, ditto, 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 but as many of you know, I was born in a house in Waitley, so I never have left Waitley, and that's where I always say, I'm always proud to say I live in Waitley, and I want to stay here for the rest of my life. I'm proud of my family, and my church, and my grange, and all the things that I, I work hard for the town of Waitley, because I love it. Thank you all very much for coming today. Thank you for doing this.